Good evening. My name is Alex Wallace. I am a proud member of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation's Board of Trustees. And I am supremely honored to introduce Harry Smith, who I have known and worked with off and on for over 30 years. Yes, we started in our teens. Harry has had a truly distinguished career in journalism. He started on the radio in Denver. He joined CBS News as a reporter in 1986. And then for a decade, he co-anchored CBS This Morning. Then he set off around the country for a weekly report called Travels with Harry. And then he returned to morning television where he anchored the early show on CBS for eight years, making Harry having spent 17 years having to get up at oh dark 30. Harry is now a correspondent and an anchor at NBC News where he's been since 2011. He's truly one of the best reporters of our generation. And in my view, he is the best writer on television. Harry Smith. That was a really good speech. <laughs> and um, I just want to do a little tip of the hat to you, Governor, and unfortunately the Senator isn't here, but I've covered a lot of politics. And these guys eat a lot of rubber chicken. You got a little bit better meal than you probably get on a, on a weekday night, but you eat a lot of rubber chicken. There's a lot of just pure guts to go out and tell people what's really on your mind day after day after day, and to make a decision to serve a, a state, to serve, a, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're running for dog catcher, there's a neck that you stick out when you do it. And just as an American citizen, I have a great appreciation for that. though I would take a couple of issues with some of the things you said in your remarks. And I think about George Washington, and one of the things I think about most about George Washington is the peaceful transfer of power. When he said, <laughs> he said, you know, we want to make you emperor. And he says, I'm staying home. I'm just going to stay home. I'm done. So. Um, I have to say this, I do, I'm not a public speaker, per se. I type on a little typewriter and I write little things and they go on TV stories and I honestly cannot remember the last time I have stood in front of a group like this of hundreds and a lectern and bright lights and something like this in front of me. But I read recently that uh, if you really want to learn things, you should get comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's when your brain really churns, and that's when things really start to cook. We'll see if that works or not tonight. <laughs> um, I have a confession to make. I slept through American history in high school. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Um, we had a giant classroom that had dividers in it, and it held three whole classes. They'd open up these dividers, and one teacher would take turns and at a lectern like this teach, and I sat all the way at the end in the front row over there, and it was one of those kind of half desks, right? So I could put my elbow like this and pretend I was taking notes. Um, I apologize for that. And I would say, um, when I got to college, that all changed. And I've been making up for it ever since. Neither of my parents made it past junior high school. I'm the youngest of eight children. My father drove a truck five and a half days a week and was a part-time cop in our town. He didn't serve in World War II because this house full of kids, draft board, didn't want him. And so he joined the albeit tiny police force in my hometown of Lansing, Illinois. Think Barney Fife without the slapstick. 
Supper time in our house was very ritualized for when my father got home, he would read two newspapers, cover to cover. My mother would have to back time dinner to coincide with my father's news consumption. And I suppose it wasn't until I was maybe 40 or 50 years old by the time I realized that my being drawn into the news business was influenced by my father's daily news consumption. Uh, the first glimpse of that happened in my senior year of high school when I quit the varsity basketball team to join the speech team. <laughs> Drop Mike. <laughs> my best friend said, you'll be a quitter all your life. It was only good news to the people on the speech team because we had a really good speech team. The speech team was better than the basketball team. We went to state, okay? I didn't have North Star exactly, but I was on my way to becoming a reporter. I started on the radio in Denver. And I had this radio show where uh, I would do a lot of interviews. And I heard that David Duke, the Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan, was touring the country selling white supremacy. So I thought, I'd better get him on the radio and expose his cowardice and cruelty. Now this is before the internet, this is back in the 1970s. So I spent two days in the Denver Library researching the Klan, and what I found out was Colorado was one of the most clanned up states in the country, all the way to the highest reaches of government. The Klan, as I continued to read, had a kind of a holy trinity of hatred, blacks, Jews, Catholics. I'd find out later on in my life there was a uh, columnist for the Denver Post named Jane Amel, Amel Lay, he was uh, his Italian descent. And he said when he was a kid growing up in North Denver, they never left the neighborhood at night because it was too dangerous to leave. These are Italians living in the United States and of America in the 1930s and 40s. Anyway, uh, I was sort of like Saul on the road to Damascus. After reading that piece of American history, my eyes were open and I was, yes, fully awake. Um, the world is filled with things that I never knew about, things not taught in the classes that I slept through. In the beginning, I covered strikes, snowstorms, local sports crime. I got to know the people in the emergency room at the public hospital the cops and the politicians. I'd go on to cover wars and revolutions, disasters, human tragedies. I'd interview presidents one-on-one -on -one in the White House. And when the cameras are all set and you're seated and you're waiting in silence for the president to come and sit down, you marvel for a moment at what a country we live in that a kid like me could end up in a place like that. On occasions, we were doing a live show from the White House Rose Garden with a, a, a live audience who were gonna ask some questions of Bill Clinton. Now, I grew up in a very conservative household, and no one in my family had ever voted for a Democrat. Ever, ever, ever. Did I say ever? No one had ever voted for a Democrat. And my mother was very suspicious of Clinton. And during, uh, we invited her to come down and be part of the audience. And during a commercial break, he took some extra questions. My mother pops up and she says, Mr. President, do you do a daily devotion? Do you have a daily devotional? And he proceeds to explain what it is and how meaningful it is for him. And he recites some scriptures. I mean, he knew the words to the hymns. This guy was pretty smart. Much to my family's surprise, there is a picture of someone er somewhere in our family archive of my mother hugging Bill Clinton. <laughs> Not to be outdone, some years, uh, some, some years before that, we were doing a live show at the uh, White House from the Rose Garden with uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. And uh, we'd gotten to know uh, President Bush f fairly well. So when he was running for a uh, re-election, he was uh, doing an event in Detroit. And then he uh, agreed to do an interview with us 
in uh, Dearborn at Greenfield Village at the Henry Ford Museum there. Well, my in-laws live just blocks away from there, and they are dyed-in-the-wool Democrats. Their arms would break if they ever voted for a Republican in their lives. And they said, no, yeah, we'd want to come. We want to meet a president. So 15 minutes before the show is supposed to go on the air, Mr. President comes in, Mr. Bush, this is Herbert Walker Bush, comes walking in. And he, we make all the introductions around. I said, Mr. President, I'd like to introduce you to my in-laws. This is Ralph and Joyce Cuzlitz. And I can see my father-in-law's knees are actually shaking. This is a guy who did two tours as a Marine in the South Pacific in World War II. This guy wasn't afraid of much, but meeting a president for a guy like, a blue collar guy like him, this was a big deal. So I jump in and I said, Mr. President, Ralph was in the South Pacific when you were. And he said, what division were you in? They end up chatting like this, chatting, chatting, chatting. It's a minute before we go on the air and we can't tear him away from my in-laws. He does the interview, we wrap up, there's a couple of pictures taken. Like I said, Jim Baker comes through the door, Marlon Fitzwater, Air Force One is waiting, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. He makes a beeline to my in-laws and he starts talking to them again. Addresses them by name, by the way. And it was just one of those amazing moments, what's almost like an out of body experience, is this really happening? So what happens is, there's a picture, my in-laws with President George Herbert Walker Bush blown up this big in the basement of their house in Dearborn, Hi in Dearborn Heights, right next to the prize walleye. <laughs> Which is, you know, I mean, that's, that's a pretty honorable, honorable place to end up. As a reporter, I have lived a most fortunate life. I have been an eyewitness to history. I've also been able to observe America on a, a kind of granular basis. I've done multiple stories in all 50 states. I've done stories in every single continent. And when I show up at things, I want to repeat what was said earlier, the things that we think are most important, or at least we hear on the news are the most important things, are not the things that are top of mind for most Americans. People are working hard, they're raising families, trying to do a little bit better than their parents did, or at least keep up. I see a lot of volunteers, folks who join committees to raise money for a new ambulance or build a new ball field, folks who volunteer at food banks, folks who want to see their families succeed, and folks who care about their neighbors a lot. And when I meet those people, it doesn't feel to me like we live in a land divided. In fact, it feels a lot more like e pluribus unum, which is out of many, one. Just a few months ago, we were in a public high school in a working class neighborhood in Erie, Pennsylvania. One of the coolest things I have ever seen. A vice president of the high school had gone to a symposium of ham radio operators. Show, uh, uh, you know what ham radio is? Used to be those guys who, civil defense volunteers who had all the antennas on their cars and stuff. And you, you know, you can get on the ham radio and talk to people and wherever. So he went to this symposium and he found out that these ham radio guys often do communications with people in, this, in the space station, right? 250 miles above the earth, going around the earth at what, 17,000 miles an hour. So he says, I bet my kids can do that. Well, the ham guy said, no, we do it. And the teacher says, no, I think my kids can do this. They all jumped in, they raised the money to buy the equipment, and we were there the day they tried to make contact with the space station. This was so cool. High school gym is packed. And the kid, the guy's name, I wrote it down, Giles Veet. He was the captain of the advanced technology club at this blue collar high school. And he gets on the mic and it's, everybody can hear what's going on. And remember Apollo 13, when they you know, used 
gaffer tape to put stuff together and they're coming back into Earth's atmosphere and they keep calling up, they keep calling up, they keep calling up and they don't know if these guys are dead or alive. It was a lot like that. <laughs> this kid is up there and he says, NA, uh, NA, NA1SS, this is KC3SGV. <laughs> he says it once, he says it again, he says it again, he says it again, and then suddenly there's a voice coming back to him from the space station, and it was bedlam in this high school. And it just, it was so interesting to me because the kids had done it themselves. They'd raised the money, they'd stayed after school, they'd come in on weekends, there were parents helping out too. And the vice president, principal, when it was all over, says, maybe now we can get some funding from the school board. <laughs> we were in Springfield, uh, New York, a couple of winters ago, and I met this woman named Ashley Sikama. And it's COVID. A lot of stuff is, there's no gatherings indoors. And she's in, in charge of the parks in this little town, just above uh, Cooperstown, New York. And as she's driving around her, her area, she sees that there's a, a, a population of Amish there. And the Amish have outdoor ice rinks. She had $5,000 in COVID money. And she said, you know what? We're gonna build us an ice rink. So she goes to the Amish and says, would you build us one? And they said, sure. And they said, we'll pay you for it. No, we don't want your money. They came out, built this beautiful ice rink. And all of a sudden, I mean, it was literally like Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. People came out of the woodwork. There were people out there. I see people donated more than 50 pairs of skates. So everybody's skating. People had never skated before. People hadn't skated in 20 or 30 years, and this, they strung some lights up at night so people could skate at, skate at night. And it was interesting to me because there was a community that was like, we need to be able to see each other. We need to be able to connect in some ways. And this wasn't a brilliant, uh, like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be a world changing thing. It was an ice rink, $5,000 of COVID money. And she said, you know, Sometimes it's better to uh, ask for forgiveness instead of permission because she just went ahead and did it. But those kinds of things happen in our communities every day. There's one more person I want to tell you about. There's a violinist I met named Kelly Hall Tompkins. She's a concert violinist. She plays with orchestras all over the world, all over the country. And we met her when she was uh, doing the uh, Violin solos and Fiddler on the Roof. Dee 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 dee. You gonna sing along? Dee 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 dee. Amazing talent, this woman. So as we got to know know her and sort of hear her story, one of the things I found out. Oh, excuse me, a black concert soloist, by the way. I said, so tell me a little bit more about you know what you're up to and what barriers you may face. And she said, well, I got no barriers. We just play. And uh, she said, uh, but she said, you should come and join me sometime because I get my classical music friends and we go and we play in homeless shelters. She's done more a hundred of these concerts where four or five of these musicians get together, they play these classical pieces. People have tears in their eyes. They think it's the most beautiful thing that's ever happened. And when I ask the musicians what the experience was like for them, they say, this is the best performance of our own entire experience because the audience is so grateful for the music that they hear. Um, we're supposed to get you out of here by eight o'clock. What time is it? <laughs> Just about time? Just about, I got one more for you. <laughs> so there's a, uh, there's a big new series now at Steven Spielberg with the B-17 pilots. We met a guy named, uh, a couple of years ago, we met a guy named Justin LeHue who is a um, um, recipient of the Navy Cross, which is second only to the Medal of Honor. He fought valiantly and saved many, many lives in the uh, war in Iraq. And now he works uh, with, a, with a group that does 
basically anthropological digs at sites where they think there may be the remains of MA MIAs. And between World War II and the world wars in Asia, the numbers of MIAs are anywhere between 50 and 70,000. 50 and 70,000 of families who have never been made whole by knowing whatever happened to their loved one that they lost. And one of the digs they did was in Germany near Leipzig, and they found the remains of an Army Air Corps lieutenant named Carl Nesbitt. Carl Nesbitt flew a plane called the Yankee Doodle Dandy. The Yankee Doodle Dandy uh, was visited when it was first commissioned in the United Kingdom by uh, the man who was the star of the movie, Yankee Doodle Dandy. And um, this Carl Nesbitt had flown more than 20 successful missions in this plane. Now what people don't understand, if you were in a part of a B-17 crew, your chances of survival of a single mission were under 50%. So this guy's on this uh, mission over, uh, over Leipzig, very dangerous territory. The plane gets shot up and it turns upside down. Nesbitt stayed at control of the plane. And because we know this from after, after uh, there were, what's the name of the? After action. after action reports. And we know this because as this cap, this Lieutenant Nesbitt holds this plane, upside down after it gets hit, eight crew members were able to bail out and all of them survived. As we were in Carlisle, Pennsylvania for the ceremony welcoming his remains home, one of the children of one of those survivors came to speak about how Captain Nesbitt had held this plane upside down all the way to its reaching the ground so these eight other crew members could have a life that they would never have otherwise. Those are Americans, folks. They are amazing, amazing people. Um, that's what we're made of. Those are the people who live next door. Those are the people who live down the street. Those are people that many of us will never meet, but they're the folks who tie us together who make us e, pluribum, e pluribus unum. There's a lot of American stories to tell, and I want to really congratulate Colonial Williamsburg for telling more and more of the American story. I was on Nassau Street earlier today, and I got a good look at the archaeological site of that first Baptist church, and the next door, the restoration of the Bray School for black children. It's amazing, it is amazing. Years ago when I was here with my little kids on a July afternoon when it was probably 90 degrees and the candles were melting as fast as my children were, <laughs> that sort of stuff wasn't on display. Um, and I know there are other efforts that are being made to also include people who came that were here before any of us Europeans showed up or any of the Africans who were brought here against their will. Um, I read a quote re recently about uh, one of those early folks who came here to Virginia, and this is what he said about what he found. We found the people most gentle, loving, and faithful, void of all guile and treason, such as lived after the manner of the golden age he said, the natives weren't barbarians, they were ancestors, and the new world was the oldest world of all. Imagine, if you will, if we can pay homage to them along with all the other American history we've got to celebrate in a couple of years. To Colonial Williamsburg, I say keep fighting the good fight. Really keep fighting that good fight. And a friend of mine told me this the other day, this wonderful black woman who's a, a reporter at NBC. Rahima Ellis is her name. And she said, you know, when you go to the doctor, you've, they give you the, 
that 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 clipboard, and it's got all those pages of things you got to file, you know, fill out pages and pages and pages of stuff you have to fill out. And she said, "That's your history. That's your medical history." And she says, "You want to know why they ask for your medical history? Because they want to heal you." Thanks for having me. We hope everybody has enjoyed uh, the evening. Carrie Smith, those remarks were absolutely wonderful. I think it gave us incredible insight into who we are as a people. And I think one of the things that we must recognize is that there is far more that unites us. Far more that unites us. And I think your speech gave us wonderful insights into that. As Americans try to figure out how to make a better life for themselves, for their children and their communities. So thank you. And thank you, Governor, for your incredible remarks. They were as inspirational as always, and I think gave us much to think about as we begin our work over the next few days. So that concludes our program for this evening. Uh, we will, what time tomorrow, Dana? 8.15 will be our first speaker in this room. So we look forward to seeing everybody then, but please enjoy each other's company. Uh, the bars are open if you would like to continue the evening. So thank you all very much.